So I've got module one and module two up. And so this is week two, so it's module two. So general safety knowledge quiz. Um, if you look into Screwjax, I added a couple things to it so that just to bring some clarification. Um, let's see how quickly it uploads. I brought in some information about just how to uh, just kind of understand the threads just a little bit better. Major mm -hmm. diameter, minor diameter, pitch diameter. Um, and then these show pretty good examples. So major diameter, so you're making half 13s, right, on the threads. Yeah. Um, so the outside diameter is the half, but it should be a little bit smaller than half. So usually about 498. Um, and then your minor diameter is going to be right around oh, 410, 415, somewhere, probably, probably around the 410. So major diameter, pitch diameter, and minor diameter are probably your most important things diameter-wise. Pitch diameter is the halfway point between those two threads. So take your uh, major diameter, subtract your minor diameter, divide it by two. That'll tell you what your pitch diameter is. Uh, your thread angle should be 60 degrees. And then you're also, so you actually have two pitches. So you have pitch, high point to high point, or low point to low point on each thread. Mm -hmm. So that's how you count out your 13 thread and then pitch diameter. So um, that's all just kind of listed out there. So that's just some um, thread information. And then I also have um, some other thread information, major diameter, uh, major minor diameter chart. Just so, um, and a lot of this is coming straight from the machinery handbook. This one's, this page isn't, isn't but it's just like it. So. Here's a half 13. Um, this will give you, you know, for, for tapping it, this is your tap drill. This is your minor diameter. Um, that must be your, so minor diameter of internal threads, minor diameter of external threads, basic um, effective diameter on it. So for half 13, so 467. The basic major diameter, but you don't want to turn it to that. It'll, it'll always just be too tight to do that. So you always want to give yourself. So you want to look right from the machinery handbook to make sure that you're getting that information. And I don't know that I've put, I will load up in either general knowledge or like getting started. I'll, I'll add, you have a machinery handbook in your book, in your, in your box. I also have a 29th edition PDF that I'll put in here so that you can, if you're at home and you're working on a quiz or something, that you can then add that to it so, um, so you can access it. And then I have the male, the female, and then the assembly of the two. On the assembly, this is how I score it. So... Um, I think I would probably look at it like this because the points might change, points values might change. So I would look at 5%, 30%, 20%, 5%, 30%, 10%. 10%. That's, how I, that's how I check them. So 10% for the radius on there. D, thread size, 20%. Okay, so really you should be able to tell. So when I take these to our metrology class and I say, hey, grade these parts, um, they'll grade everything from the neural to the radius. Um, they'll manually check things. They'll use thread gauges. They'll use the CML. Um, and then just, you know, just calipers and micrometers to check everything. Do we by chance have any threading tools that are inside of our boxes or not? Yeah, you checked it in and said that you had one. I totally did. I forgot the whole list. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I have insertable threading tools. Uh, I'll have to give you an insert for it because I haven't given you any inserts yet. But yes, I have insertable threading tools for you to use. So I gave you an insertable turning tool insert, right? Yes. Um, and then so I also have uh, threading inserts as well. I'm boxing them up. I'm putting them in little packages of all the inserts and stuff. So that's what you're working on now. Uh, the next project that you're going to be working on next week is going to be the clamp on by stop. Um, really both pieces, I wish I could put both pictures up there together of them. You probably have, do you have the printouts of them already for the buy stop? Yes. Okay. So we'll look at one of them, but basically they are the same part. 
Um, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow. Depends. Right now, eight o'clock, you got a lot of classes are kicking in pretty quick. So let's just go download it real quick. And we can, if you download it, it's, it's in immediate. So both pieces are really similar. Um, as far as the milling goes, they are identical. And lots of times I, I just have a student take a piece of half by half stock, a long piece, and then all you have to do is mill this step in it. So we'll side mill it. We're going to go through milling today. Um, side mill this edge and then saw them into two pieces and then mill the ends of them. And so um, one inch 430 and um, that's, that's for your overall length. You get plus or minus one on that dimension. I need a quarter inch delivery. Okay, it's going to be a few minutes, uh, but yep, I will get you one. Where is that at? For the uh, plus or minus 100? Right here. So 430, the replace decimal, is plus or minus 1. Anything that's two place decimals is plus or minus 5, one place decimal is plus or minus 15. Right. So on this one, you're going to, you, so both of them will be the same outside shape same step, same length, but where they start to change is the hole work. They have the same hole spacing. These two are reamed through 250. That's gonna be press fit for a dowel pin. Then this hole is um, quarter 20 tapped through, and it's got a counter bore, and it's centered. And then the other one is the holes are 255, and they are also, it is also counterboard, but then it's got a larger hole so that the bolt goes through it. And I can show you what one of them looks like when it's done. But they should be springy when you go through it. When you get ready to start that project, I'll give you two dowel pins, a socketed cap screw, and um, a spring. That way you can make sure that it all fits together. Uh, when you see dimensions like this, 310, that's a 516 drill. Because 310, or 312 is 516. So that'd still be intolerance. Two place decimal, you get five. They can go all the way up to 315. And so we'll just dr drill it 312. That'd be really the nominal on it, anyways. Um, no, that's not true because it's plus or minus. So 310 would be the nominal, but 312 is going to be plenty good for it. So um, this is stock. H and I are stock 375. You need to mill 250. You need to mill. So you mill. One step on that thing. Okay. When we go through the milling videos today, um, it's gonna we're gonna talk about direction of milling. So you want to make sure on like on the CNCs we would try, try and I figured if it wasn't my hand it would not do that. But um, so CNC we would mill up to this side. Conventional milling, you're going to mill this way. Why is that? Because it's going to, it'll suck the cutter out of it if it doesn't. Uh, or it's going to pull the table away from you or towards you, depending on where you're at on the thing. So you want a conventional mill, so your end mill is on the right-hand side of the material. When you're CNC milling, you're on, the cutter's on the left-hand side. So see what I mean? When, when I'm talking about it, it's on the left-hand side. If I look down, like if I stand over this thing, Milling this way, see how the cutter's on the left? Yeah. So now if I go this way, the cutter's on the right. If I go up here, the cutter's on the right. If I go up here, the cutter's on the right. If I go up here, down here, the cutter's on the right. So you always want it to be left? No, you always want it to be right. Oh. CNC, it's always going to be on the left. So if I'm on the CNC, I want to mill around this thing like this. Yeah. If I'm on the manual mill, I want to mill around this thing like this. If I'm on the inside of it, now I'm on the left, now I'm on the right. So cutter always spins the same direction, but it's, it's always, it's, think cutter always needs to be on the right hand side of the material. Right. The only time that I don't do that, um, so on the CNC side it's way more efficient to cut down, cut like that, it also pulls the part down 
to the, it kind of pushes it down on the table. Um, and it's way more efficient in the cutting, but what'll happen is it kind of helps to pull the cutter along. But on a manual mill, when you're milling, um, as it pulls the cutter along, if your table's not super tight, it'll actually, you, you've probably seen people that the table go, <coughs> they're, they're going the wrong way. So you wanna make sure you're going the right way on that so that the cutter's always going the right way. Um, so if you just think about it, the cutter should, no matter what, always be on the right hand side and then you'll be okay with it. Um, let's see, let me close that. I think that happened actually uh, last year for a CTC for a student. It happens all the time. I walk past people all the time looking for people on the wrong way now. And uh, they're like, oh, geez, I totally didn't realize that. It, it's, it takes a little while to get through, uh, especially if you're new to the mill. Okay, we're gonna go through one, two, and three. Uh, you'll have this week to do these quizzes. I mean, really, you've got till the end of the semester, but or the end of the eight weeks, but don't do that. One, two, and three are your assignments for the week. Okay, so it'll be a PowerPoint form. The video of what we talked about today will be uploaded to YouTube. You've got all the resources that you need. You've got um, unlimited tries and unlimited time to do those. So um, let's go through should never even try to, to do that. Um, okay, introduction to the vertical mill. So um, conventional milling machines are going to do any of these shapes, any of these materials. Um, they, they're they typically working in um, non-3D profile stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that I've ever seen anybody do any kind of major 3D profile stuff on anything that was manual machine. Um, working in the Cartesian coordinates, um, as same as uh, anything else. And so yesterday, were you in here yesterday with our group in the morning? You weren't, were you? No. So we talked a lot about the Cartesian coordinates and then the, what they call the right-hand rule. Um, if you go like this, go like this, this is your positive Z, your positive Y, and your positive X. Okay, so these are all of your Cartesian coordinates that we're going to be working with on the mill. So what that means, slide your book over here, is let's just say we're working on a part and this is zero. Okay, so we, edge, we want edge find here. If we do that, we put this in the corner, y positive, x positive, z positive. Okay, I'm left-handed. I find it easier to just do this. This is, this is the same thing, right? See how it is? It just looks like you didn't close your apple. Right there. I know. <laughs> I, I think that's why they... They, they actually kind of have stopped doing some of it, but um, because of that reason. But it, 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 just, it just works. So you've got this or you've got Why this. is that the easiest way? I'm left-handed. And you don't have to rotate your arm. So if you just go left hand, yeah, then those are all your positives. Nope, you don't have to rotate it up, just like that. Now, those are all your positives. That makes it more easier. Yeah, so. So, I was going to ask how your day is going. It's, it's, <laughs> so we were just apparently it's going great. We were just, I, I, I was just telling him I, I think that it's ridiculous that um, you do the right hand rule when really the left hand rule is better. Yeah. You don't have to do the twist, right. you know. And um, and so I was like, well, they call it the right hand rule, and he's like, well, it looks like you're flipping me off. I was like, I know. Yeah. It's actually easier if for everybody if you do it on the left hand. You don't have to twist it. You're not flipping anybody off. True, and, but in a school setting, now you could be... That's probably true. You know, yeah. and so it's like... You, you're, you're kind of messed up in, in either direction. Do you want feelings hurt or do you want to be shocked? Exactly. You know, exactly. which one do you want? Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. The last training that I was at, they actually said, we try to not do these things anymore. And I was like, somebody's got to have some common sense here. Yeah. You know? so somebody's got to get over it. Somebody's got to get over it. Yeah, that's right. Have a great day, guys. Thank you, you too. All right, so if the center's in, if X0, Y0 is in the middle, yeah. so you've got, this is your positive quadrant. This is your um, Y negative quadrant, your X positive quadrant. This will be your X and Y negative quadrant. This will be your Y positive X negative quadrant.
So um, it, it's pretty important to know those things as we go. And so we'll, we'll continue on. Today, we're just trying to get a kind of high view of everything. And this will also show you the same thing. So Z, Y, and X. We've got our table that travels along the X axis, our um, table that travels in the Y axis. We've got our knee that goes up and down. That's for our Z. We've also got our quill that goes up and down for our Z. Um, you know, you've ran a mill before, so you know there it is. It does auto feed. Uh, you want to make sure that you're changing the RPM while it's spinning. You want to make sure that you're calculating the RPMs of things rather than going. I don't know. That seems right because. Oftentimes it's not right. So um, here are some other parts of the knee and, or of the mill. Um, I oftentimes flip this handle around on the knee just so it doesn't stick out. When you come over to the mill, go ahead and hit this one shot pump. Give it a pump or two just so you can get um, all of these, all the, the bed area um, nice and oily. Try to keep the head back as far as you can. It's on a, it's on a dovetail. So you want to keep it pulled back as far as you can. Um, the, the further you start to come out with things, the more there are the less rigid stuff gets, the more kind of springboardy it gets as you go. Right. Um, so you want to watch those things. Um, make sure your vice handle is off before you try to start the motor up. I mean, eventually somebody does that and that's how you get those big dents in the motor where people have the vice handle on there, start it up. <coughs> and then really, really, really tighten up the draw bar almost always. Um, all of our collets are R8 collets and um, all of our X axis are power feeds, but we don't have any Y or Z axis power feeds, which is pretty common. You know, it's hard, it, it, sometimes you'll see them where they have them all. Um, you've got a dial on the edge. We've, we've got a digital readout, so we typically roll with the digital readout. Um, here is our oiling system. The knee has clamps to lock it down. Uh, this one has an additional clamp out here. Ours don't have that. Um, you've got your x-axis clamp. So whenever you're not moving in that direction on the table, you want to go ahead and clamp it down um, so it doesn't try to pull away from you. Uh, early in my days of milling, I was milling this big long plate. I had to make a keyway that was about an eighth inch deep and I wasn't paying attention and I, I set it up and I didn't have the table locked down, and I turned around to do something else, get my next thing ready. And the table, I just veered away. And so I had this keyway that was going, was supposed to go straight down through the part, and it veered off. And so I had to make a new keyway where it was supposed to go, and then we had to send it to the customer with this big long slot in it. It was super embarrassing. So don't do that. Um, you got your x-axis handles, jog handles, are just really handles, and then you've got your micrometer collar on the end. Digital readout, or I mean, I'm sorry, power feed is, is how we're going to move those most of the time. Um, this is our x-axis locks. We don't have these little trays, but uh, just in general, you, I would try to avoid putting things on the mill table itself. Right. You've got your toolbox right there. Try to use it. It's just way better. That way you're not getting chips in there. They're not falling down in the T-slots. It's just, it's just way easier to keep things taken care of. Um, so we've got the head and we've got our spindle and our quill. So our spindle is what spins. Our quill is what goes up and down um, in there. And you can actually spin that head all the way around. Here are the parts of the head. Um, and it, it, does auto, it does auto feed down. Uh, you won't get to that until really next semester. And then you've got high and low gear. And then this is how the draw bar works. It's just a sub 16 to 20 bolt, basically, that goes down through there and pulls that up. There is sometimes a key in there. So if you, generally when we buy a new mill, I pull the keys out because pe what people will do is they will not line the key up. They would drive the collet up in there and it doesn't go smoothly. They just beat it up in there. Yeah. And then they're like, hey, this call is broke. This machine's a piece of crap. And I'm like, you've got the key turned sideways in there. And then you got to beat that same thing back out. So it's easier to just pull the keys out in the beginning. That way nobody has a problem with it. Now, I wouldn't do that if it was my own at home. Speed always needs to be adjusted while the machine is moving. Um, it's got a pulley in 
inside of it that's spring loaded and it gets opens wider and closes up. And if you try to open that thing wide or crank it down closed when it's off, um, the belt will come across there and it'll smack it and and it it can do. I mean, best case scenario, it just damages the belt, but it can really destroy that. It's kind of like it's not really a clutch. So that's why you want to have the machine running and then change your RPM. Yeah. So while it's spinning, it's easier for that V to open up and close down. Right. But it 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 can't. It can do it, but it doesn't keep the same amount of tension on it. So it's kind of spring, well, it is spring loaded. Uh, so yeah, always make sure that you're adjusting it that way. Um, you've got a stop for the quill. Uh, that's really going to matter when we start to do auto feed with quill feed. Um, and then you also have your lock on there. Um, so there's your quill lock, uh, quill for when you're like drilling a hole. Um, when you're milling, try to not run your quill way down deep, like extend it out, because it just becomes less rigid. Okay. Right. Um, and then this is your quill feed. We won't be messing with any of the quill feed stuff right now. Um, that's for your quill feed as well, for your speeds. And I move over here. The head rotates this way, and then it rotates this way. Always be really careful whenever you are going to move this thing, straighten it up or, or knock it out. Like maybe you need to move it to 30 degrees or something to do some angle milling. What I would do is I would always loosen it really lightly because I have seen them where like the little gear on there was stripped out where somebody loosened it and the head just fell over. So you really want to watch stuff like that. And you also don't know how much tension somebody's put on something. So when you open it, it can really jerk to the side or to the front or to the back or whichever way the tension is. Turning probably is easier, easier. Oh, for sure, yeah. So just assume that everything has pressure on it. Um, so here's rotation this way. Um, generally, you bring it to zero, so that gets it close, and then you're going to tram the head of the milling. So here's a digital readout, um, power feed. Uh, if we had power drawbar, it would be like this. It's air controlled, so you don't have to turn that nut on there. Um, in, inevitably, what somebody does is they just, just they just hammer down on that thing and it gets way too tight, and then they're like, hey, I can't get this thing loose. And that's a huge pain in the butt. Um, and again, just loop system. So that's something that you should be checking every single day when you come over to the machine. Just make sure that it's ready to go. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm gonna out. And then we will, look at that, it's still trying to load. Um, I, I hate to download them, I mean it's way faster, but I just end up having to delete off my computer all day long, you know. It's a hassle. It is kind of a hassle. Not an air pop down. Okay, so let's look at cutting tools, and, and again, this is just super high view. Won't hurt you to go over some of these things again to just look at them, especially before you go and answer the question. All right, so um, we're going to look at work um, cutting tools. So we'll, we've got high speed steel, we've got carbide, we've got insert cutters, we've got things that we've made, we've got um, just like just a ton of different things. We typically try to stay away from end mill holders like this because it allows you to go with bigger end mills. You can have these that'll hold a one inch end mill. The machine's not designed to carry a one inch end mill, so I don't use these at all here. RA collet is our standard collet that we use, but we do have slitting saw and face mill holders for certain applications. So it's always about depending upon the application. The R8 collet has this undercut area, ground area, tapered area that's ground. This is the key way that I was talking about that sometimes people get messed up. This is 7 16 20. Every once in a while, you might have to run a tap through that just to clean it up and make sure you don't have any problems with it. A couple different styles of end mills. Um, like I said, uh, it could be anything from a high speed steel um, cutter to a carbide insert. So lots of different cutting tool types. Um, end mills, T slot cutters, dovetails, wood drift, slitting saw, form cutters, everything. I mean, there's just. The, really, the limitation is endless on there. 
So you got a two flute here, you got a roughing end mill, uh, you got a four flute, kind of a high profile um, on that, so good for like aluminum or something. Uh, then you have non-center cutting right here, so it's got a hole in the middle, so you can't, you can't, mm, can't really like plunge a something like this, like you can here, because it'd leave that recessed area in the middle. Um, but we use two flutes, three flutes, four flutes, five flutes here. So it just depends on what the need is. This generally the softer the material, the least flutes. So aluminum, two flute, 40 by 40, four flute. So just a matter of material. Same thing, just different styles of roughing end mills, uh, ball end mills. There's an insertable ball end mill. That's some form cutters. And um, so this is kind of the step that you'll be milling on your, um, on your first mill part. Make sure that you're going this way with it, okay? Uh, there's some radius cutters if you want to cut the outside radius on something. Uh, some chamfer mills here or a tapered end mill. Fly cutters, it's a slightly different fly cutter than what we have. Um, they've got a high speed steel um, tool in it. We don't use them like that. We have less angle on ours and we use a carbide. I'm guessing that's what the project that you're going to do, right? That's your next, um, that's your third project, I think. So um, your vice top is next and then the fly cutter is next after that. And it has to do by the end of these eight weeks? Oh, yeah. Um, there's some just form cutters. The difference between a couple of different tools, this is an R8, this is a Morris taper. Not the same. So this could go for like the drill press or the tailstock on the lathe. A um, couple different types of holders. Drill chucks. Um, Jacob's. Yeah, Jacob's chuck. Uh, this is a keyless chuck, and then this is your regular key chuck. You have a four-way key uh, in your toolbox, it's what we'd use for like the slitting saw, and um, so one thing I think is really helpful to have in your box is a couple of 5 style pins or a couple pieces of stock turned down to 5 eighths. These T slots are 5 eighths, the tops of them. And so you put those two pins in there, it'll help you line up your parts so it's not running crooked on there. So like if you, it'll, it'll help you get really close to it. Gauge blocks? Um, gauge blocks are, there is over by the granite tables, there are some cabinets and there are gauge blocks in there. Okay. Um, the 101 cabinet? Can you see the 101 cabinet? Yeah. It's the cabinet opposite. Right next to the drill press. I think it's the opposite cabinet of that. Okay. So this would be for like a fixture or something, or just getting something lined up close. Um, I'm going to skip down to... I'm going to think that work will work for the vice. You have to indicate the vice. Right. And, and, and that just gets you close. That doesn't get you perfect. You always are going to indicate. When you use step blocks like this, see how that's got a slight elevation you want it like that see how that's kicked back so that means it's only really contacting on this little edge right here you want it to have massive contact across there because if you have it at an angle when the part would just like move around. shoot out yep you want to make sure that it's not doing that um here's some toe clamps toe clamps oftentimes will let you mill across the top of a surface so these are probably like a mighty bite or something um Here's some quick release clamps. This is by far our standard right there, the 60 curve vise. When you're milling um, round stock or oddball stock, you want to make sure that the center of it is below um, the jaw so that it's not, it doesn't pop out of the chuck. Uh, and then we'll talk about squaring up as we go. Um, a couple different styles of vices. So you got your sign vise there. You, got your, you can even use a three-jaw chuck on it. Call blocks, We've got some guys out there using those right now. And then just some fixturing stuff. What's that? Simple stuff. Yeah. And let's go back one. I'll catch this last one. And so like I said, you, you want to go through some of this stuff on your own. Um, oh, is that you're gonna do that maybe later today? Yeah, good idea. 
all I'm doing is kind of catching the high points of these things, just so make sure that you're familiar with these things off the top of your head. Um, all right, talking about safety and then tram in the mill end. Um, and we've already talked about some of these things. When that, sometimes I will just come in and knock the heads out intentionally. That way you'll have to square them up. Students have a huge problem. I mean, you saw it on the CTC side where people are like, I ran this mill yesterday. It's trammed in. I'm pretty sure it's good. I'm not going to check it. I'm just going to go. And then they get their part done and the head wasn't square uh, or the vise wasn't square and their parts all crooked. Every single day, you always... So when you're done milling, you'll always unclamp the vise. In the morning, you'll always tram the head and you'll always square the vise because you just have no clue what the group after you. There's three groups that are coming through here in the day. You have no clue what they're doing, you know, not including the CTC. So there's actually five groups of students that are going to be through here every single day. The chance of your thing being right is really, really slim. All right, um, so you want to make sure that your head is good and squared and trammed up. Uh, this is, these are ways to get them close, to use like a, your largest square. So if, it's, if, it, if you're like, I'm just trying to get it somewhere in the ballpark, you run a quill all the way down, you bring your square up against it, that gets you close. That does not get you perfect. Indicator is how you get perfect. And then you're going to run some type of um, some type of holder so that you can spin the, the spindle. Yeah. You know, um, we've got the uh, magnetic little magnetic bases. Yeah, you can just set on there and spin them. You can do it on a gauge block, or you can do it right on the table. I typically do it right on the table, and the reason why I do that is I don't want to introduce more opportunity for error. Sometimes people use a plate like this. Problem with the plate like this is if it's not flat then you just trammed it not flat. So I usually shy away from stuff like that. I typically don't let vices like this go on our tables. They have a rotary on them. Um, generally, if I need to move something like that, I'm gonna put the vise on the table crooked at an angle so that I can do my angle milling that way. Um, I think these vices have a tendency to wobble back and forth. So try to stay away from those kinds of things. Tram it in, bring it across. The way we teach you to do it is you put the vise on the table, you'll tighten down one side, leave the other side loose, and let it pivot like that. So you bring it over here to zero, you bring it over here to 10. This side, you're gonna make it from 10 back to zero, and then snug the bolt up, drive it back over, and it'll be pretty darn close. And so you're gonna just keep going back and forth. We're making videos on all those things too, so. Of videos for that. But everyone should know how to dial vice. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Everybody should know how to do that stuff. All right. So sometimes you have the vice on there crooked. We've already seen that picture before. Here's a stop that somebody set. So they, they, they line this up square. That way if you had multiple parts that you need to butt up into a, a flat area, you can. That'd be, that's good for something that you're going to do repetitive. So maybe you got to do 10 different parts. All right. Speeds and feeds. So this will be one that this is in Machinery Handbook, this is in your textbook. You've got some other cheat sheets and stuff for this. Um, this will take care of um, speeds and kind of calculating some uh, cuts. So if you're working on aluminum, your surface footage is anywhere from 600 to 1200, that's a huge range. Um, and then chip load per two, smaller cutters, smaller cut, bigger cutters, bigger cut. Generally, I'd, I'd say try to not take more than a third of the end mill when you're milling. Okay, so if you got a one inch end so mill. What, take 10 thou passes or? No, about a third of the end mill. So if you're going to, so let's just say you're using a one inch end mill, just mm -hmm. for easy math. Don't take more than about five sixteenths of a cut. That'd be 315 thousandths. So, and that 315 or one third of the end mill can be calculated either in depth or in diameter. So it could, maybe you step down the whole width of the end mill, um, or the whole depth of the cut that you're going to go, uh, step over 312 thousandths, or maybe you've got a cut that's only 150 thousandths deep and you want you can step over more. But you should be looking at that cut versus your end mill saying, I'm about a third of it into the cut. So 10 thousandths cuts all day long is just going to wear everybody out. It's going to wear your tooling out. 
It's going to so wear. So you can't take big cuts. Oh, you should take about a third of the end mill. You should be taking, if it's one inch end mill, you should be taking at least 300 thousandths of a cut. That'll make my life easier. It should. You should always be taking big cuts. Big cuts, <coughs> I mean, except for your finish cuts. Your roughing passes, your finish passes are in the 10 thousandths depth of cut range. So don't you have to change your RPM to get a finish cut? or You sure can. Um, a lot of times you might even change end mills. So maybe you rough it with a roughing end mill, and then you change to a finishing end mill, kick the RPM up, lower the depth of cut and the feed rate. So the idea is rough it out as fast as you can so you can spend the extra time finishing it. Right. All right, um, so you can always print that out or refer back to that. Um, let's see, we're not gonna do that. Edge finders, edge finders come apart. That absolutely happens. Edge finders really like to run about 1,000 RPM. So running an edge finder at 200 RPM, it's actually gonna be less accurate. Edge finders are three separate pieces with some springy stuff in between. So you've probably seen them break and you've probably seen them come apart. So um, this is a center finding one. Um, this is a single ended one. This is double ended. Uh, typically the ends of them are 200 thousandths or the diameter of the shank. So it could be 200 thousandths, it could be 3 eighths, it could be half inch. Uh, just make sure that you're paying attention to what that is. You have one of those in your box. Um, I've got some steps, and in the CNC Fundamentals book, I also have um, a step-by-step -step of how to use the edge finder, and we'll also have a video for it. So, um, indicating a hole, got a video for that. Um, indicating a square, it's just a matter of making sure that when you spin your indicator in, it's just like indicating a hole. Yeah, if it's zero here, it should be zero here, it should be zero here, it should be zero here. As long as it's square. Rectangle would be something different. Locating on a pin would be just like just picking up on a diameter. Offset boring. I'm gonna skip some of that stuff. Um, you can bore two size uh, on the mill and you can auto feed with the quill. But in 102, we're not gonna cover that. We're gonna cover that basically in 103. Uh, but I do want you to be familiar with it. So this is talking about work, um, our feed direction that's cutting. So we're, we're, we're seeing those things. Um, cutter rotation, climb milling, conventional cutting, just like we were talking about. Um, and then, well, we still want that though. But yeah, 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 right. I mean, you want in the vise as much as you can get. I think I've seen two Oh, I've totally seen some people do that. When we get out to the shop and start doing some squaring, we'll talk about some of these, these operations. Um, but just remember, we want to take, we want to use as big of a cutter as we can, and we want to take as big of a cut as we can. Don't let the caliper be your go-to measuring tool. Use the micrometer. Calipers are great for dimensions up to about 5,000. But if you want more accuracy, you always want to You want to use your micrometer. That's what that thing is there for. Um... Just a couple of uh, examples of squaring, and here's again um, conventional milling versus climb milling. Uh, a lot of that stuff we'll cover out there. Here's using a vice stop. Here's using a vice stop. You're making a vice stop. Slightly different than what that is, but it's pretty close. Some different fixturing. Um, chamfering. Yep, chamfering. Um, some of that stuff is probably easiest to show you out on the machines as we go. Some of this is a little, it's going to be a little bit kind of theoretical. All of those, you're going to have the chamfering tool as straight as possible. If not, then your chamfers are going to be all wonky. Super one wonky. One side will have feet yeah. on your side, one side will have yeah. smooth side. Yeah. All right. So I'll let you go through the rest of these slides. There's really just, there's not much. It's yeah. none of this stuff are things that we're really going to be doing this semester. You're going to be doing some pretty straightforward milling. There's a roughing in mill. Um, yeah, I'm just going to basically cutting a third. Of that's where you want to take your big cuts in with a rougher. Especially when we're talking about steel. And what tool do I need to use for uh, cleaning? Cleaning the surface? Like oh, making your yeah, So on aluminum, I'd use like a two fluid in mill. On our steel or ferrous materials, I'm probably going to go with a four fluid finishing in mill. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop there. 
and let you pick up the rest of it, and you should be good to go after that. Okay, so you've got you've got the PowerPoints, you've got three quizzes. Go back through the PowerPoints, um, do your three quizzes. Um, you can go ahead and print out if you don't already, or you already have the vice stop, print it out, right? And um, so, yeah, should be good to go. Yeah, you can go ahead and print that out. If you don't already have it printed out, just go over to the print station, print it out, and um, that will be it. The rest of your time this week will be just out in the shop. No school Monday. Um, and then probably Tuesday, I'll bring everybody in for Module 3 for Lockout Tagout. So for the vice stop, does it have to be aluminum or steel? Steel. Okay. And you won't need a rougher on it, really, because it's such a small cut. It's such a, it's a really small notch in it. But I do want you using the roughing end mill versus just, a lot of students have a tendency to just go straight to a four flute 